Welcome back everybody to this third section of our lecture on crying in H Mart. Today we're going to talk about race. We're going to talk about language, both the Korean language and the language of grief. And then we're going to look at the close of the novel. So this, I think this book is an excellent uh, description of, of what it feels like to be mixed race uh, and to sort of feel between two cultures, never quite belonging in either place. And this is a story that I think we're, we're hearing more and more, uh, but it's one that we need to hear out of many, many people's mouths because each experience is unique. So we're going to dive right in to some of the quotations where I think um, it, it's, I think, some of the most valuable work in the novel Oh, there it is in the novel, in the memoir. Um, you know, obviously, I think the most important work is 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 the the discussion of her grieving for her mother and sort of her own personal evolution as a young woman and as an artist. But I do think that um, you know, entwined in all of that is this sense of uh, of of herself as being half Korean and half, you know, North American, Caucasian. So on page thirty three here. She says, I didn't have, this is when she's just moved to Eugene. I didn't have the tools then to question the beginning of my complicated desire for whiteness. In Eugene, I was one of just a few mixed race kids at my school and most people thought of me as Asian. So at this point, um, she's discussing the fact of, you know, jettisoning her, her middle name and and sort of really wanting to, to she realizes that she can sometimes pass for white um for a long time she wanted to be more korean and then at some point it flips so you have this sense of ambivalence about race that's very different than than the immigrant experience if both of your parents are um you know of the same ethnicity so we're going to go to page 81 to get a slightly more in-depth look at that sort of feeling so on 81 up here toward the top, if you happen to have the book in front of you, she's talking about the Korean language school. Most of the kids there were full Korean and I struggled to relate to the obedience that seemed to possess them inculcated by the united force of two immigrant parents. A little further down, perhaps by nature of being of my mixed upbringing, I always felt like the bad kid, which only made me act out more. So again, this is an example of telling, the, I think it's such a funny description, I didn't read it here, but it's of all these kids sitting on the curb with their, you know, their snacks and just like sitting by themselves and entertaining themselves like very quietly. So she, you know, she attributes a lot of her sort of wildness to both of her parents, actually, because both of her parents are very big personalities and take up a lot of space and are very energetic. But sort of the root of some of her behavioral outbursts which I think there are probably lots of factors, um, but one of them is this idea of, of not sort of fitting in in either world. So we're gonna look at 95 and 96, the last example of, of sort of these more overt uh, discussions of race that she, uh, that she talks about. So um, down here, this is, she, she, there's that amazing scene where she's always felt very athletic and then in middle school in sixth grade, which is, sort of, you know, the beginning of the end of self-esteem. And it's like that real sense of wanting to fit in. She loses that running race and suddenly like her whole persona crumbles. And one of the girls in the locker room is asking, are you Chinese or are you Japanese? And then down at the bottom, I wanted to inform her that there were more than two countries that made up the Asian continent, but I was too confounded to answer. There was something in my face that other people deciphered as a thing displaced from its origin, like I was some kind of alien or exotic fruit. What are you then was the last thing I wanted to be asked at 12 because it established that I stuck out, that I was unrecognizable, that I didn't belong. Until then, I'd always been proud of being half Korean, but suddenly I feared it had become my defining feature and so I began to efface it. So one thing, um, brief interjection here, the idea of who she becomes as a star, she she owns up to the fact that she's always like being the center of attention. She's always like performing. But um, when you look at her music videos or you look at still photographs, which I will have um, on the YouTube channel, 
Um, but when you look at photographs of her, she really is leaning into her Asian ethnicity. And, and there is a sense of, of really sort of owning something again, like getting back to a place where, where uh, a lot of the aesthetics that I read, at least as Asian, are um, really come to the fore. It's interesting to me, though, that it's called Japanese breakfast. So she said that she was inspired by a menu and that this idea of sort of um, like what it would like entail, what a Japanese breakfast would entail and how separate and how kind of, um, I mean, I think a lot of people in the United States are sort of off put by the concept of, um, of, of having like pickled fish for breakfast. Pickled is maybe a little bit more Scandinavian, but this, this idea of a Japanese breakfast as being so foreign and kind of literally hard to stomach. Um, it's interesting, so I understand the reference, but it's interesting to me that because, of course, if you call yourself Japanese breakfast, people will make the assumption that you're Japanese and not Korean. So maybe she's just like messing with people. Maybe this is his idea of sort of confronting people's assumptions. But I also think it's it's interesting that, that she's leaning into her Asian-ness, uh, but not, you know, but has this kind of big um, label on herself that is in fact a different country uh, in Asia. Okay, so speaking of Japanese, um, I the word Japanese, I wanna talk a little bit about Korean language and, and some of the really great ways that it is incorporated into the memoir. So on page eight, we have very early in the book here, we have, um, this really great sense of kind of this matriarchy. You have this very large, um, you know, sort of outsized uh, figure of her grandmother who really kind of casts a shadow, not in a bad way, but like as a really big presence throughout, kind of. I mean, poor Michelle is afraid of her. <laughs> she sounds really like kind of a mean person, but but you have this sense of matriarchy here that's very appealing and, and of Michelle, because she is an only child and a daughter, of, of being sort of, um, you know, the, the, the legacy, being kind of the, the next step in this matriarchy. So on this page here, we have this idea of all of these women and this idea of family, but it's very much bound up in the Korean language. So again, page eight, we'd sit cross-legged on the cool marble floor, slurping and reaching over one another. My aunts and mom and grandmother would jabber on in Korean and I would eat and listen, unable to comprehend, bothering my mom every so often, asking her to translate. So right at the very beginning of the book, you have this sense of real distance because the language imposes, even the word jabber, like jabber, jabbering is kind of, um, it's, it's not exactly like denigrating the way that they're speaking, but it's that sense of like, it's, it's not, it's totally indecipherable. It sounds like nonsense because it's just jabbering. Um, so, so there's this sense of being really drawn to these women, but of course there's this gigantic gulf. And we see it in the end when she has that beautiful relationship with her aunt, and yet they really struggle with the language barrier. I mean, it's called a language barrier for a, a reason. And I loved all of the discussions that she had with her mom because, um, you know, when she has her mother's spoken lines are, are, are reported to us, there, there is a sense of her as not being entirely fluent in English. And you really get a sense of how, um, how it would keep them from knowing each other. If they're, if they're sort of, it's hard enough to know your mother and your daughter, but if you then have a, a, a difference of language, if you truly don't speak your mother's you know, mother tongue, then it's going to be very difficult to to, to understand on, on some very subtle sort of syntactical and grammatical levels. Okay, we're going to look at page uh, 60 briefly here. So um, this is, I loved this description here. Every time my mother spoke Korean, the text sprawled out before me like a Mad Lib, words that were so familiar mixed with long blanks I couldn't fill in. So that's a, um, I like that as a metaphor. It's, um, I'm going to just sort of let it rest. But to me, it really, it really worked well. Um, and then we're going to look at page 118 at another example of the Korean language. So this is a really beautiful thing that happens here. So down, this is when she, they, they both are very sad about her mother's diagnosis. We're reading down at the bottom of the page. Gua chan ah, gua chan ah, she said, it's okay, it's okay. 
Korean words so familiar, the gentle coo I'd heard my whole life that assured me whatever ache was at hand would pass. So it's it's interesting here. I'm just going to note this guachana, guachana. She said, it's okay, it's okay. We're given the translation here because we need it because we she's assuming that we don't speak um, any Korean, but she is giving us this very explicit translation. And then um, and then it, what happens later, let's see, on page 121, we have this very nice echo of that same thing because we have learned that phrase and now we're familiar with it. On 121, it says, um, down here when her mother's having the really awful breakthrough pain, she, they, they have given her more appropriate medication and Michelle is saying to her mother, any second, any second, just another minute and this will all go away. Guachana, guachana. So it's this very beautiful thing. Um, luckily, it's only three pages after we have learned the term. So you have not only, you know, th this nice, this, this very sort of soothing, um, you know, very important, very kind of foundational phrase. And then we have this nice, you know, it, it's sort of this consoling, comforting noise. I mean, to me, the, the, the Korean, it, it doesn't have that valence, but for Michelle, it does. And then just three pages later, we, you know, having had the translation are now hearing that term again. It's kind of like hearing a song that you liked well enough when you very first heard it, but when you hear it again, then you really get to like it. Um, it it's a bit like that. We're, we're having this same term come back up. Um, but there's also a really interesting thing that's happening where the daughter is the one who's having to say it to the mother. So you have the sense of, of, of the language as living on in the daughter, but you also have a sense of role reversal here, which is very difficult. You know, you have this sense of Michelle Zahner is really having to step in as a mother and to, to, to make her own mother feel better, which is a very difficult uh, piece of, of aging. Okay, and then um, there's the, I wanna look at the Korean language in this one last instance that's just so beautiful. So this is page 197 and 198. So she and her husband are, um, I loved their story. I just, I loved everything about it. Um, he's really cute. You should see pictures of him at the um, in the images at the end. They're like, just like the cutest couple. So on 197 here, we have, um, the two of them are on a, a flight back to Seoul, I believe from, San Francisco, maybe. And she's talking about Korean airlines. They always fly Korean airlines and how for her mother, that was like the beginning of the trip was, you know, the minute they boarded the aircraft because the language was familiar and there were magazines and food that all came from Korea. Okay. So on 197 here, unlike the second languages I attempted to learn in high school, there are Korean words I inherently understand without ever having learned their definition. There is no momentary translation that mediates the transition from one language to the other. Parts of Korean just exist somewhere as a part of my psyche, words imbued with their pure meaning, not their English subtitles. And the interesting thing about this um, is then we find out a little lower that her first word, in fact, which is very significant, was a Korean word and it is the word for mother. But I want you to keep in mind that idea of, of these words that have, she has never learned the term, but in, but in fact, they just are, are they're, they're innately understood because they have been spoken in context to her her whole life. So then we have on page 225, this is so cool. I'm, I'm a real language, you know, freak. So I really loved the way that this functioned. Um, on 225 up here, She's, she's getting the, like a Korean bath. She's getting, um, you know, the, the, the body scrub and the massage and whatnot. After I'd soaked for half an hour, an Ajuma dressed in a white bra with matching underwear called for me to lie on her vinyl table. So th the sentence itself is somewhat unremarkable. But what I loved about it is when she says an Ajuma and then, you know, goes on, you realize as an astute reader, I'm sure you realize this, um, that ajuma is a word that we have been hearing in different contexts throughout the entire memoir. So she talks at one point about ajumas as serving food in the Korean markets. And there's a, 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 
a, a description of an Azuma who is um, in a restaurant who is is doing this barbecue type of thing. So and then so you ha I, I I thought it meant like a server, you know, like a like a um, you know a chef or something. It, but then here when we have this Azuma coming in, I immediately had a sense like, oh, the term Ajuma is like an attendant or like a helper or an aide. And it was such a nice, again, I'm a little bit of a, um, a of a language nerd, but I loved this sense that we, there's no translation for it. And yet this is a term that we have learned from Michelle Zahner, you know, and before that from her mother, this idea of, of, of understanding a word without any kind of translation. There's just this sense of like, oh, this is someone who is 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 aiding us, whether it's with food or you know. And I don't understand the nuance. I would need a few more examples. But it was this really magical use of uh, of the Korean language. Okay, so I want to um, dive in very briefly to the language of grief before we look at the close of the novel. So the language of grief here is it's so well done because um, you know there's been a lot of talk recently ironically, um, talk of, of how difficult it is to express difficult emotion. So um, I read an article recently about how limited our language is to talk about despair or depression or anxiety. Um, th those are terms that are just very difficult to come by. Be they just partially because, you know, emotions are difficult to put anything I mean, language is so arbitrary. The word depression has nothing to do with, you know, feeling blue or feeling glum or feeling down or whatever it is. Um, but language of grief is also, I think, um, you know, there are lots of images for it and there are lots of attempts, but it's a very difficult thing to describe grieving. Um, but I think she does a pretty good job. So on page six here, um, this bottom paragraph before the space break. Sometimes my grief feels as though I've been left in a room with no doors. Every time I remember that my mother is dead, it feels like I'm colliding with a wall that won't give. There's no escape, just a hard surface that I keep ramming into over and over, a reminder of the immutable reality that I will never see her again. So again, this is this metaphor and it's actually to me, Oh my God, I can't believe I'm being more critical, but it, it, it's a bit, um, it feels a bit sort of overwrought, a bit kind of uh, constructed, if you will. Uh, but I also think it's it, it's very uh, apt, it, it, that, that idea of running into the wall over and over, and this, and this idea of being inside this space with no doors, and that idea of claustrophobia, and that idea of hopelessness and feeling trapped, and the idea of never seeing her again, all of that I think is well done. On page 155, we have another example of, uh, of her attempt to express her grief and her process of sorrow. This is, I mean, warning. If you don't want to hear about rigor mortis um, and kind of a gruesome description, you might want to just zip ahead a little bit in uh, your listening. So um, right here on page 155, it's really um, a graphic and I think a really excellent inclusion in the novel, but it is difficult to hear. Rigor mortis made it extremely difficult to dress her. Her arms were so stiff, I was afraid of breaking them as I pushed them through the sleeves. Her body was heavy, and when I set down her weight, her head plopped onto the pillow and her eyes bounced open. I let out a wail so full of anguish, neither Peter nor my father dared to enter. I kept at it, pushing at her dead limbs, my own body collapsing beneath her every other moment to writhe and cry and scream into the mattress. Overwhelmed by wretchedness, I had to pause to let it settle. I was not prepared for this. No one had prepared me for this. Why must I feel it? Why must I have this memory? They were just going to put her in a bag like trash to be removed. They were just going to burn her. So this is such a, it, I mean, this is a bit of a masterclass in my opinion. Um, one of the kind of adages that I, that I actually adhere to most in terms of like MFA advice is that you want to describe what is evoking emotion for your character or for your, in this case, for yourself, um, not the emotion. Like telling, saying I was sad is much less interesting than, than telling us the actual things that are making you sad. 
than sort of describing them. This case is, it's horrifying. It's horrible to think this, the, the description of the head plopping onto the pillow is, is so, um, it's so well chosen, that word, because it's so awkward. It's so, it describes kind of the, the, the sort of weirdness and like absurdity of this whole thing. And for my money, the descriptions of how difficult this is um, and how awkward and kind of horrifying, like this idea of the arms being so stiff, she's worried she's going to break them. I mean, that those those descriptions are much more effective than words here like anguish or um, let's see, or of uh, writhe or of uh, scream into the mattress and overwhelmed by wretchedness. So this idea too, um, it's interesting to me that when she talks about anguish and wretchedness, she's kind of lapsing into this very old, like almost Dickensian language, like overwhelmed by wretchedness. It, it's sort of this idea that like language is so, it's so kind of arcane and it's so old that it's difficult to, to, to have like a new word to describe it and being wretched is kind of, um, again, it feels like it's right out of Little Dorrit or David Copperfield. Um, but then this idea of, um, I was not prepared for this. No one had prepared me for this. You know, in large part, she's talking about her mother who is now um, absent. And then why must I feel so, why, sorry, why must I feel it? Why must I have this memory? So why must I is again, this kind of arcane language. And I think on some level, I like the idea of this grief as feeling very, very old. You know, this is sort of, it's a story as old as time to use a cliche. So it's fitting on some level that she's saying, why must I feel it? Why must I have this memory? But there is also something about how um, there's nothing new. There's no new way. There's no more effective way to talk about grief, except in this case, she's doing the right thing, which is also to give us this very clear description. Um, she also talks about two memories that linger that are very difficult for her. And I think th those are some of the um, the most powerful things. She returns to this idea of the eyes opening. Um, and I think that that anyone who has lost a parent or, or seen someone who's really sick, I mean, we all have these images in our minds that we wish we could get rid of. And I think in time, you know, people do find that those images recede and that you remember the good stuff and not so much the horrifying ending. Um, but I do think not enough people warn you that being around someone who is dead or watching someone die is really brutal. I mean, and there are images you really wish that you had not seen. Um, okay, we're gonna move to the close of the novel. I'm gonna touch on three different quick um, sort of visits here. So she is in Vietnam with her father and then she's in Seoul and then she's in Seoul again in these, these three instances I'm going to walk through. And what I like is that these three instances, uh, they all have to do with music and they have to do with her becoming a, a star. I've got a little bit of a star motif going on here. Those of you who are watching the, um, the YouTube channel, uh, my shirt from before uh, and this shirt here, we have, we're doing a little star theme. Uh, but you have this idea of her really finding solace in music in a way that I think is very convincing uh, and very well done. So we're going to look at 179. This is when she and her father have that fight in, uh, in Vietnam. And she's so appalled because he treats people badly. So after the fight, she goes by herself to, a, um, to, to sort of a nightclub slash cafe slash bar and it's an open mic kind of karaoke thing. Maybe not karaoke, maybe it's just an open mic. So down at the bottom here of 179, we have this interaction with this kind of magical person who, who is there at the bar also. So she says this woman's name is, um, I, I, it's Q-U-I-N-G, I believe, I, Quing? I'm gonna just go with that. Quing says, I come here because I am sad. I love to sing, I come here every day. I'm sad too, I said, my second beer starting to unravel me a bit. Why are you sad? I want to be singer, she said, but my parents think I must go to school. How come you are sad? Which of course is so beautiful because this is an absolute echo of that heartbreaking scene where the mother says, I'm just waiting for you to get over this. You know, we have this idea of her as being um, like, you know, trying to really share her aspirations with her mom and then realizing, in fact, that that, that is not possible. 
So we have Queen who's doing this exact same thing, saying, I really want to be a singer. Um, my parents think I need to go to school. So I took a sip of beer. My mom died, I said finally. I realized it was maybe the first time I had let the words leave my mouth. So we have this idea of this catharsis beginning. Queen put down her teacup and put her hand on top of mine. You should sing something. She leaned in closer and stared into my eyes like she was certain this would solve all my problems. It was how I'd felt about music once, back before everything happened. A pure childlike belief that songs could heal. So I love this. This is sort of page, what is this, 180? So we've got another, you know, what, 30 pages, I guess, to get through here. Um, more than that, 50. We've got another 50 pages. But we do have this idea of, of her being able to begin to talk, like she's beginning to be able to verbally process just by saying, my mom died. Um, but you also have this sense of her as being, um, looking to music again for a sense of healing and solace. So um, we're going to go a little bit further down here. She starts to sing um, the song Rainy Days and Mondays, and which is so cute because that's a song that she and Peter sung at their wedding. Uh, and it's a very sad song. It's a song I love by Carole King. But so she begins to sing, and then I love this part. I began realizing the microphone was heavily drowned in reverb. I sounded fantastic. There was literally no way you could sound bad with this thing. I closed my eyes, leaning into it, channeling my best Karen Carpenter. So you have um, th this sense of her as like, like it it's so surprising because she's like, whoa, wait, I sound amazing. So you have this sense of buoyancy that, that music is providing her in this moment. And you have a sense like, okay, this is one of the ways that she is going to be able to, um, you know, to heal and to emerge. And so then we have this other uh, here with Quing, we danced to all the songs, cheering the loudest when they were through. She told me about famous Vietnamese singers. We talked about our dreams. I finished my last beer and we hugged goodbye, took down each other's emails and promised to keep in touch, though we never did. So you have this, this person who sort of comes out of nowhere and is this very important kind of alter ego, this young woman who has a beautiful voice, just like Michelle's who really believes in the power of music. And then happily, she just kind of disappears. And there's a nice parallel between this and the mother, both of them as, as, as being sort of fundamentally important in, in Michelle's grieving process and in her life, uh, but also a sense of, of those people as being limited and, and that's okay. You know, it's, it's fine that they didn't in fact keep in touch. This is, um, again, we are in this, in, in moving toward the close of the novel, we are looking at these places when, when music is becoming healing and she's really, um, you know, she's, th th this turning toward creative output is, is really very, it's very indicative of, of the happiness that is going to return to her. So here we are on uh, 232 down at the bottom. She's at, she's playing um, a, a, a venue in Seoul, which is this huge accomplishment for her. And I have a photograph uh, in the images of that space. And it's really very cool. When we got on stage, I took a moment to take in the room. Even at the height of my ambitions, I had never imagined I'd be able to play a concert in my mother's native country in the city where I was born. I wished that my mother could see me, could be proud of the woman I'd become and the career I'd built. The realization of something she worried for so long would never happen. So you have this real sense of kind of victory here of her being able, um, you know, she doesn't have her mother, but there is this sense of, of returning to soul and her origins. So you have this beautiful, um, you know, sense of, of sort of victory there. And then um, I actually also, I have an image, uh, uh, like a, like a, in the, in the images in the end, I have a, an image of, of the set of music that, that she plays, which is great. And then finally, at the very end of the novel here, um, novel, at the very end of the memoir here on page 238. So she's with her, uh, with one of her aunts and she is in Seoul with her husband and her aunt and her aunt's husband. On a whim, Emo Boo suggested we end the night with karaoke. And then we're going to bump right over here to the last paragraph. So it's important to know at this point that she, uh, her mother was a fan of these two sisters and 
they found one of the songs that they play. It's actually very like psychedelic and cool. It's kind of a like a late 60s kind of interesting uh, a song. It's really, really good. But so we have her here attempting to play the song that her mother sang as a young person in this karaoke bar. And it's just an absolutely beautiful evocation of the healing power of music and also of the idea of, of her mother sort of living on in her, but also um, this, this sense of her Korean heritage as really being very well intact, which was a question at the beginning of this thing. You know, if I don't know which brand of, of seaweed we used to buy, am I still Korean? And here at the end, we have this sense of, of, of yes, you know, in fact, she's very much in touch with this heritage. Okay, so we're gonna close this third session uh, with this last paragraph. Peter and Emo Boo clapped in time with tambourines that lit up multicolored LEDs every time they were struck. I tried my best to sing along. I chased after the Korean characters that seemed highlighted at the breakneck speed of a pinball. I let the lyrics fly from my mouth, always just a little bit behind, hoping my mother tongue would guide me. So it's beautiful. Of course, I love that conflation of mother tongue and mother. I think it's just such a gorgeous ending to a book that is really powerful and evocative, really a good statement of uh, the importance of keeping culture alive, the importance of the healing, um, the healing process, not only of singing, which is very much to the fore here, but also, uh, you know, the importance of, of sharing our truths and sharing our, um, you know, our memoirs, sharing our uh, reality and our, our experience of very difficult processes in this life. So I hope that this uh, 90 minutes has been helpful and I hope that you join us again, head to the Fox page to find other lectures, to find recommendations, to find nostalgic throwbacks and uh, check out the YouTube channel for images from Michelle Zahner's incredible Crying in H Mart.